report card uh, of sorts on the nation's health. And so, so it's stock full of all kinds of things. So I thought that was a neat, a neat example of, the, of a time series graph. And then back to uh, Florence Nightingale. This was one of her bar graphs. We have a, we have a guess. Hello, Dr. Illich. How are you, Professor Illich? How's it going? I'm good. Where, would you like to talk to us for a minute? I would. I understand. Uh, I believe you made it very clear that I get no more than five minutes, or I'll be kicked off the Zoom meeting. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, I can. I can. Uh, I can remove you at any time. Okay. But um, I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop. Well, we're, we were just right here talking about bar graphs, and right. this is a pretty famous one from. Uh, uh, Florence Nightingale, do you remember that? I well, do. Seen it, yeah. Okay, so that was looking at, this is looking at the uh, comparing death rates to army at home versus the English male population. But I'm going to stop my share and let you have, have a few minutes to talk to us. Well, um, I want to welcome everybody. Did they, does everyone know that I'm Besides your guest lecturer today, I'm also the president of Southeast Community College. Well, I think they know that now. Do you want to see them? Okay, they know that now. <laughs> so I'm delighted to be here. Let me show you and share my screen, and I'm going to be very quick. And at SEC, uh, my background is research, and so as the president, we utilize data daily, uh, and often it starts with a simple graph. Um, let me show you just a few graphs. I've taken them, I screenshot them. So can you see this, Gail? We can. Okay, so these are all screenshotted from what's called Tableau, which is an interactive visual analytic tool. You'll probably talk about that at some point, that or a similar product that allows you to interact with your data. But let's just keep this really simple. So this particular graph came up when we were trying to make a decision about, um, you know, how how do we move forward in terms of the fall semester? Is it the case that we should? Can you, um, can you close that document recovery and it, just so we can see, see the graphs a little bit bigger, you know what I mean? So like close that and then close the format. Yeah. Yeah. This. Our screen is a, oh yeah, that's perfect. That looks okay. great. So as we were trying to make that decision, what we, about well, how do we move forward in terms of the fall semester. Some colleges went only online. Some, uh, probably the majority of colleges kind of did what we did, which was move forward with our original schedule with all the appropriate safety protocols. But a question came up. Well, we showed in the spring that everything was fine online, moving things to online. And I said, well, let's, let's look at that. Is that really the case? So what you're looking at is a number of success measures, GPA. This is for all students at SEC, success rate, that's a C or higher, and then a failure rate would be a D, F or a D or an F. And the withdrawal rate means that you, a student chose to withdraw from classes. So these are spring semesters, and you can see with the GPA right here, it may not look like much of a difference, but going from 3.8 to 2.9 is a huge difference. And the reason why it's a huge difference because there's about 17,000 records underneath this, and that's because We've got about 9,000 students. Most of our students take somewhere between two and three classes. So that's a lot of data. So that drop was very, very much significant, which your students will learn about very soon. Look at the success rate, 83 to 75%. DF and W rate went from 10.8 to 15.5. All of these are significant. Withdrawal rate, six to nine, very different. And you can see this was true also of the hybrid in interestingly, even the withdrawal rate uh, went up among um, online courses, and that's probably primarily because um, some, many of our students take both online and face-to-face, -face, so maybe they drop all of their courses. But this was very useful to see this graph, and so I think, you know, um, if you're in the class looking at all of this, know that Professor Illich isn't just talking about something that is relevant to the class. This is we, we do, we use these types of graphs every day. Let me show you. Um, so this, that, that was one of the reasons, or um, I think, I think, okay, never mind. So the other thing we wanted to do was talk to the students. So we sent out a survey and we said during the spring semester, when we had to pivot to everything online, was everything okay? 
Well, the students told us 50% said it wasn't okay. They prefer the face-to-face -face learning. Um, they talked about they lost some motivation to complete the coursework. They couldn't, they were having difficulty focusing. That was 42% on paying attention to remote instruction. That was just something new to them. So we used all of this data together. But again, you can see how easy it is to understand. Well, you might have an issue if half of your students say they prefer face-to-face -face and it was, a, it, was, it was difficult to stay motivated. So let me just, um, I'm just gonna go through some other examples of how we use data. So here's a different looking chart. And we monitor this chart every day. And what you're looking on the left-hand side, that's the number, this is, fall, this is fall enrollment. And we start monitoring fall enrollment in March. So 142 days out and we, and we track it very carefully uh, to see kind of where we're landing. Now on the right, you see the bar charts that Professor Illich was talking about. And you can see right now we're at about 9229. And we've, last fall, we were at 97.69. Now that may seem like, okay, you're down a little bit, but given that we're in a pandemic, only being down 540 feels like, um, that feels like a really strong enrollment for this fall semester, given some of the circumstances. I wanted to point out the nice thing about a line graph is you see how the lines were together in the tool about right in here. Well, this is when the students, which would be you in the classroom today, weren't sure what SCC was going, going to do. And we started to get the word out right in here that we're coming back. We're gonna have face-to-face -face opportunities as well as online and, and hybrid. But we made it clear the schedule is gonna stay the same. As students understood that, we got phone calls, we got emails. Are you sure you're really gonna have face-to-face -face, or are you just saying that? We're like, no, we're sure. And as we communicated that, the lines started coming together. So again, very helpful to have a line versus a bar chart in this particular case. Um, here's another interesting example of a nice simple bar. There's six Nebraska community colleges in Nebraska. And what you're looking at in this graph um, is on the left-hand side, those are millions of dollars. So, and you're specifically looking at what's called the fund reserve. That's how much, if you think of like a banking account, that's how much you have in your bank account. Now it may seem like a lot here, but because these are such huge operations, they have to have a lot of money just to pay their bills from month to month. Now look at Metro, they're approaching, they're over 90 uh, million in fund reserve. And if you look at Southeast, we're more like 50 million, about the same as Northeast and a little bit more than Central. Now, this is important because when I'm talking to my board and trying to explain whether or not our fund reserve needs to be increased or it's okay, I need more information. So this is, FTE stands for full-time equivalent. It's kind of like a head count, like an enrollment number, but we combine the full-time students with the part-time. So you can see Metro is just below 10,000 and we're just above 7,000. But the others are much smaller. But remember, I pointed out that we were about the same fund reserve as some of these smaller institutions. So now we can combine these graphs and create what's called uh, a title cash reserve per FTE. And then if you look on the far right, that's 1718, you can see SEC has the lowest fund reserve per student equivalent, full-time student equivalent. So that's something we're working on to kind of get that up a little bit to give us more financial uh, options. And then the last graph I promised Professor Illich is an interesting graph. It's showing student uh, course taking patterns. So you're looking at each day of the week, and what you're seeing here is the total number, or this is Lincoln campus only. You're looking at the number of students that are in our spaces by time of day. Most of our students take their courses right here uh, between about eight and 12 and one. That's super important because we run out of room, classrooms. So that's one reason why we're expanding new health science building, other spaces. We just don't have space during those peak times. Well, you might say, because sometimes our board members and other community members will say, well, your students aren't utilizing the space down here. Well, every, you all know that are listening to me, many of you work. About 80% of our students at SEC work, at least part-time. So they need blocks of time to work. So we can't just fill up our class spaces all day and all night. That just doesn't work. 
I do have one final graph if that's okay, Professor Lynch. Yeah. Okay, we also track where our students come from. This is, um, this particular is not a bar chart. It's a, it's a geographical uh, based graph, but it's really nice. You can see most of our, our uh, 9,700 students in the fall of 19 came from Nebraska, but some came from all of the states, almost all of the states in the US. The, uh, one reason why this is so important is because Nebraska needs to have more people in it in order to address some of its challenges. And one way to do that is to try to get more people to come to our institutions of higher education. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, hopefully that was helpful to the students to see that this is just not something that you're learning and that's it. It's not gonna be useful in your life. You will be using graphs, wonderful tools. Uh, they help start a conversation that sometimes leads to a broader research study where you can really dig in and find out what's underneath it. All right, how's that, Professor Illich? I think I did go a little bit over, but not much. Yeah, Abe, have a question? You want to know about his background, his educational background? Why don't you tell him just for a second about your educational background? Uh, my PhD is in experimental psychology and behavioral neuroscience, which means it's a basically a research degree with a lot of emphasis on experimental design and um, um, statistics, applied statistics, and strategic kind of thinking. So you might wonder, um, you know, how do you take that? How did I become a president? Well, really, being you know a president is very much like being over a very large research endeavor because I get information every day and I work with the leadership team to understand that information and to try to provide you know fulfill our mission, which is to provide the best possible experience for for everyone. We're open access. We want to be affordable. We want to be high quality. We want to uh, make sure we're meeting employer needs, community needs. So really, a research background is so, so helpful. It really allows me to kind of see things and try to understand. Maybe I can't understand what's causing it, but I get a better sense of what might be causing, uh, for example, a decline in enrollment or an increase in enrollment. But that's my background, and I love being the president of SEC, and I love the fact that each of you chose um, to come to SEC. How did, how did you start um, your higher education? Well, I started, I uh, was a first generation student, didn't know anything about um, college. This was back in the 1980s before almost all of you were born, well before. And um, I was a pretty good runner. So I got a track scholarship, again, to a two year college. So I started at a community college. I earned, I found out pretty quickly I was better at learning than I was running. So I earned my associate degree at uh, Blinn College in Brenham, Texas, and then continued and earned my bachelor's and then pursued a PhD um, and then followed that with a postdoc for several years and then decided I wanted to kind of go into a more applied direction. So I went into institutional research at a community college. I've always wanted to be at a community college because I love the fact that it gave me a start. Okay. Yeah. I'm forever appreciative of, of what the community college means. Uh, so I hope you're all having a great experience. I know this is a little unusual time. I do think you were, you have an excellent professor and maybe I'm a little biased because I am married to Gail, but our professor Illich, but he's really, really good at what she does. All right, well, um, thank you. All right, thank you all and have a great rest of your class and hope you enjoyed a little bit of a, application with uh, grants. It was very good, very good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, see you all later. Bye. Okay, you have to kick me out, it looks like. Oh, I, okay. Oh, wait, let me stop. I, I can do it. Oh, are you gonna do it? Remove, bye. Okay.